Laudate Divinum. Praise our wondrous Lord, the Divine, for he is the gifter of life in his home of benevolence, where he embraces us dearly with his golden celestial rays of sublime sunlight, in which we are forever thankful for a wondrous and bountiful day. It is here, in our kingdom of Foxton, did the religion of our beautiful Lord begin. Here, in these hallowed halls of the Cathargis de Exashikato, I shall be your remember answer, the voice of our Lord, and the voice of the past. Together, brothers and sisters of the Cathardis, we pray, we learn through the past to not sin in the eyes of our Lord. This shall be a reading of documentation of our history as told in the Verbum Archangelorum, our holy texts, written by our first saint, Saint Loretta. This is where we shall begin. Now, let us delve into the sanctity of our beloved words. Beginning with the opening of the Verbum Arc Angelorum, the tale of Saint Loretta twas when humanity was barbaric, shameful, writhed in sin and debauchery. In the early years of mankind, before the awakening and the arrival of our Lord and Saviour in mass, did Saint Loretta be birthed onto Isilion. She was ill-fated from birth, it seemed, as her tale is woeful. From her first hour on this earth, she was born into the harsh ashlands just north of the borders of Valpen a rugged and almost inhospitable land. The air was supposedly thick from unending storms of warm ash that swept down from the dragon spine mountains in the east and from the lake-ridden swamp lands that we now unfortunately call Lockwin. Hmm. The clan she was born into were slavers, barbarians and brigands nothing worth praising. How such a perfect soul would be born there is unbeknownst to me. Why would the divine forsake her, you may ask? Strength, my brothers and sisters, courage and resilience to temptation and sin is why she was placed there. Her mother, according to Loretta's own writings, died during childbirth and her father was murdered a few days before. Young Loretta was left, alone, and abandoned by her family. She had no elder siblings, only two cousins, but they saw her as a runt and quickly abandoned her. Her chief of the clan, well, he was a brute of a man, decorated in ghastly vin trophies, if you want to call them that, of course, of human hands, skulls, and lockets of hair. His skin was greyish, tattooed with the black, angry stripes, and no air was upon his head. His skin, broken, calloused, and filled with these discouraging tattoos. This chief was named Chief Zanbarash, he was known for enslaving other clan members, even his own people, and poor Loretta, from the age of seven, would be put to work amongst the slaves, raking in the fields and mining small stones for materials for building. Worry not, my friends and brothers and sisters of the clergy. Loretta was a hearty young girl. It seemed as if the divine himself had a plan for this girl even without her knowing. She was plagued by dreams, you see, visions of a man 
bathed in golden light. He had no body, but seemed as if he was made up from millions of stars. This, in today's world, we know as fact that her dreams were that of the face of the divine. In the latter part of the Verbum Archangelorum, he is described as such, with beauty and intensity unmatched by any mortal. And that beauty we cannot comprehend as mortals, so we see him as a visage of stars bathed and wrapped in golden light. Loretta grew from girl to young woman, treated still like a mule, heavily beaten by Zanbarash and his cohort of horrid warriors. The men seemingly thinking she was easy as a target, but Zanbarash never allowed such horrid things to happen to her. He wanted Loretta for himself as a wife. Loretta remembered every word that he spoke about her. I apologize. Things may get graphic. He said, A strawberry blonde hair. Such a rarity. She'd make a fine wife for this clan. To bear my children and have me plenty of sons. So that they take my rule after I depart from this ashy land. She'll work as a slave forevermore, but she'll be my personal servant, and none shall take her from me. A slave, a tool, a thing, but my thing. Loretta was only but a young woman, that of sixteen years young, but she was to be wedded. To many scholars' surprises, she took this position of wife with glee. And you may think to yourself, why? I too found myself puzzled. We pride ourselves on lawful marriage in this religion, and not of that of debauchery and horror and distastefulness. But our beautiful saint, our wondrous lady, had a plan, you see. She knew she'd be toyed with. She knew she'd be beaten too used forever as a plaything by this man-child. Until the day she died. The wedding was simple. They bound her hands together and cut her wrists open and connected her open wounds with Zanbarash's own. A blood pact. It was not like anything we do currently, I assure you. Loretta was abused, hurt, emotionally crushed by this barbaric man. But she did not feel pain, as the plan she had in motion was to usurp the crown for herself. In her sleep once again, the vision of the divine finally spoke to her. In her words, he said this to our patron saint. My child, my broken and woeful child, I shall not let this monster hurt you no more. Ill-fated you shall be no more. Break your chains with the strength I shall grant you. You will be my prophet. Destroy this oppressive clan and rebuild it in my name. Be the messenger of the Nephilim, for I am the Divine, your God, your Master, your Saviour. No longer shall tyranny plague you, Loretta. She didn't know what to think of this. Her mind raced like a wild horse through the open plains of Alpen. But then she was awoken in her sleep once again by the ravaging Zanbarash. He picked her up by the throat and hurled her across the floors of the chambers, demanding to her, It is supper, yet you have not fed your king. You sleep when you must work. This is your last straw, girl. 
I shall sew your mouth shut and cut off one of your hands. Zambarash unsheathed his copper sword, the blade reflecting the light of the fireplace. He walked his way up to Our Lady, trying to intimidate her further. Loretta felt that her consciousness was trying to slip for a moment, as her heart was trying to rip itself from her chest in sheer panic. I... I can't do this. I'm not strong enough. Please, whoever you are, save me! She hurled out, through a panicked voice. Zambarash raised his blade and stopped. The flames in the fireplace stopped flickering. The cheers and laughter from the drunken clan members ceased. Time had paused. Such is the majesty of our Lord, the power he has above us as mere mortals. We shall forever worship his wondrous powers that our patron saint had witnessed firsthand. The divine had emerged and spoke to our saint. Be still, Loretta. I am the voice that spoke to you in your dream. I am the divine, the god of humanity and your savior. Had I not intervened, you would be missing an entire arm and your mouth forever shut. This I could not allow, especially with your plea, child. For I have chosen you, Loretta, to be my first saint, my physical manifestation upon Isilio, the bearer of my word. To do this, you must follow my instructions. Uh, anything! She begged, still in shock over the events that just occurred. The Divine spoke once again. Be the blade. The warrior I know you are to become. I bestow you a gift, the Celestine Gladius, a blade forged in the heart of Nephilim forge grounds in benevolence. Unsheathed from his gilded cloak came a blade decorated with a language that we know today as that of the word of angels. A longsword imbued with radiant energy, decorated in gold and bright blue gemstones in the cross guard that brightened the room around her. As she took the blade, timidly, armor swirled its way around her frame, clinging to her body comfortably. Plate metal also forged by the Nephilim, decorated in the same style as the blade. Her breastplate decorated with the symbols of Nephilim, two wings reaching her shoulders, sprouting from her heart. The Divine spoke once again. Loretta, my guiding sunlight, destroy these villains in my name. Raise a banner to the northwest of this land. There you shall erect a holy shrine to me and my kind. We, together, shall be the light in these times of darkness. He vanished from her sight, and time resumed. And with her newfound purpose, she was stoic, and no longer fearful of the brute that had tortured her since birth. She spun around and drove the blade into his surprised spine, bringing him to his knees with an agonized scream. She retracted the blade, rose it hide, and bellowed out, For the Divine! Using the sharpest edge of her blade to slice through skin, muscle, and bone of the brute's neck, his head ripped and sliced clean off from his body. The thug fell to the ground, blood pouring from his neck as his body twitched in unsettling motions. Loretta breathed as adrenaline surged through her body. She turned her attention to the fireplace and chucked his loathsome bedsheet into the fire, causing the entire small shack to burn. She kicked open the door, and in the darkness of night, she once again raised the blade high. A light of pure 
brilliance seared out from the blade, blinding all of the damnable sinners. She rushed forward. With her renewed strength, she surged through, cutting down all those who would enslave or try to halt her in her escape. She cut, she stabbed, she swung and cleft, all in a deadly dance of light and radiance. All the while she cut through the chains of the enslaved, freeing them in a deadly dance. One warrior remained after the onslaught. One of Zambarash's personal guard. But he did not fight. He dropped his blade and begged. The first penitence. Loretta offered him a hand, made him rise to his feet, and spoke. There is always redemption for sin, for the divine will absolve you through penitence, child.